Hi everyone, uh, happy to be here with you. Sorry, a bit of traffic. Paris is not yet that resilient, or we are not that resilient. Uh, prevented me from being absolutely on time. Uh, happy to be here with you today to discuss. So my name is Elizabeth Laville. I'm the founder of Utopi. Utopi is a 25-year-old uh, think tank and consultancy specializing in sustainability strategies, working both with companies and, of course, also with um, cities and local authorities. Uh, we're going to discuss um, resilient cities uh, in this session uh, with a a uh, timeline that has been given uh, by the organizers. So 15 minutes, I will ask questions to our speakers. 15 minutes, you can ask questions to them. And then 15 minutes, they will ask questions to you. So get ready for your answers as well. Um, just a quick, uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to welcome them because we do, we, before we do an intro, an intro. So I'll welcome Sébastien May, which is Chief Resilient Officer, CRO for the City of Paris. Welcome, Sebastian. And Olivia Armanta, which is Associate Director in charge of City Relationships with 100 Resilient Cities. Please take a seat. Um. So in today's world, um, large cities appear a bit as giants with feet of clay, as we say in, uh, in French, because they have such a high concentration of wealth, population, economic activities, high concentration of jobs, of course, logistics, infrastructures. But then on the other hand, they also have the highest concentration of resource consumption, and most of the time without having the production of these same resources in the area, so mostly imported, consumption of imported uh, resource, and of course also concentration of downstream environmental impact, as we all know, and also a concentration of social or wealth inequalities. So it seems that large cities are at the same time maybe the, the best or the, the uh, very ad most advanced uh, places in the modern era, but also um, uh, complex systems with uh, intrinsic uh, fragilities that could prevent their future growth or development or obviously the future blossoming of all the living systems uh, in the cities. So we're going to discuss that with you guys and since I have the first 15 minutes to ask you uh, questions, I'd like to ask you maybe two or two and a half questions. The first one would be for both of you, what is your definition of a resilient city, of course? Uh, based on Paris experience for you, Sebastian, and based on all the cities that you, uh, that are member of 100 Resilient Cities and all the ones that you know for you, Olivia. What are also for you the key aspects and key factor of success of a good city resilience, urban resilience strategy? And maybe also a question related to the definition of urban resilience, uh, which is, is resilient city only a response to risks and challenges? Or can we say that there's also a positive, desirable vision of uh, the city of tomorrow? So two questions for you. I don't know who wants to start. Olivia, maybe? Okay, so I think um, we've taken a general def definition of resilience, and I think in the urban context, we're really trying to understand it uh, in 100 resilient cities and, uh, and through this initiative as uh, the ability to adapt or survive um, in when faced with acute stresses or shocks. And so uh, I think the understanding there in, in terms of shocks are earthquakes, flooding, et cetera, so the disaster component. But in terms of stresses, it's, it's understanding um, different elements like social inequality, traffic, et cetera. And so how do these other um, stresses contribute to the urban environment and how do you plan for them? So I think that that's the general framework that uh, we've been using to understand that. And I think that in that process, we've uh, also devised some different methodologies and tools to, in fact, understand how do you get at those different components of, of resilience, of which I can speak more. But I'll okay, you... Sebastian, your definition? It's the same, because I belong to the same network. Um, <laughs> but uh, I want to insist on stresses, because in France, at least, and I guess in many other places, Resilience is mainly understood as a way to answer and bounce back after a main mm. shock. Uh, earthquake, flooding, uh, terrorist attack, uh, and so on. But uh, the, the specificity of 
the approach of a hundred resilient city is to combine solutions to address both the shocks, but as Armanta just said, the chronic stresses that affect the resilience of a city may be more than shocks on a daily basis. And this is not that frequent. Usually the industrial resilience, for instance, it's the way your process uh, keeps working during a shock and then get back to the original situation. And this is the other difference. Even after a shock, if you just come back to the initial situation, you're not resilient. You're just repaired. You have to come back to a better situation because you learned from the shock uh, in order to be more resilient to face it again. And, and so this approach is wider than the classical one because we try to build solutions in our cities that try to address both. And this also builds on what I said, given it's not a reaction to challenges or shocks or threats, but it's also, also a way to get a better city step after step. Okay. Uh, mm. Resilience is positive, much more than risk management, for instance, because we often compare both. Uh, but resilience is not only something that, is, that says, be careful, you've, you're going to face many difficulties and you have to get prepared and to bounce back and so on. No, uh, resilience is protective. It means that you anticipate and you are ready to face the shock. So it's a positive approach and this is very important. Okay. What are, in your opinion, the key factors of success of a good uh, urban resilience strategy? I would say that um, something that we've been really thinking about in, inside of the foundation and within this initiative is um, how do you engage different actors and different stakeholders in different um, areas of government, in business, in community to, in fact, look at either the same shocks or to integrate uh, thinking around different stresses. And so to make that a little bit more concrete, I would say uh, when we're looking at a problem of flooding in an estuary area, for example, which is a, a real issue for Puerto Rico um, and San Juan, we look about at the communities. So you have uh, raw sewage and um, urban planning issues, but you also have this area that's integrated near the, the economic community. And so I think it's really this integrated thinking around who are the different actors that need to be at the table, not just in government, and how do you integrate uh, urban solutions that don't necessarily only address the flooding, but issues beyond that to make the, the city more adaptive? Sebastian, from your experience with Paris, key factors of success? There are many, but I would insist on three. The first one, it's people. And th the best way to be resilient within a city is to count on people. And this is going to be the backbone of Paris resilience strategies that will be voted by the city council next September. Uh, I, maybe I can develop afterward, but the, the, the more inclusive a society is, the more able it is to face any kind of shock. Uh, when the infrastructure or the processes uh, failed, uh, what do you have? Your neighbor or the, the uh, person in the streets that is who is going to help you. So counting on the people is really a key for resilience and we have to reinforce inclusive policies, reduce inequalities and so on. This is a, a strong key. The second one is infrastructure and urban planning because of course we have to build our cities in order to be resilient against the main challenges of the 21st century. Uh, sometimes it's against huge events like flooding and so on, but global warming uh, requests that we change radically the way we are building our cities. Uh, we're facing it now, heat wave in June, uh, a couple of weeks ago and now, and our cities are made with concrete. Uh, they're, they're not green enough, there is no water enough, and we have to change this. And the third one is governance. Governance because there is no way to be resilient alone. If a city hall is resilient alone, it won't work. If a private factory is resilient alone, it won't work either. Every, everybody has to be resilient together and has to think about resilience in a systemic way, a holistic way. And so governance, being able to link all the different kinds of actors within a territory is a key uh, to build resilience. Um, Sebastian was insisting on the, on the importance in Paris resilience strategy of both enhancing social cohesion 
and reinforcing territorial governance. Can you elaborate a bit on this based on your experience with other cities on those two, the impact of social cohesion on one, the one hand and, and territorial governance on, on the other hand? Yeah, I mean, I think I would share the, the idea that there are these three elements in terms of planning. And I think, so I work largely in cities in Latin America, and I think that the, I would almost explain it like human-centered development. So essentially, you have very um, specific cases in, for example, in Medellin or in Mexico City where you can see that the understanding isn't just about um, transportation systems, but really how do you uh, bring people from the outsides of the city that are poorly communicated, not necessarily have access to employment or to social services, and how do you integrate that into the thinking? So I think that uh, the social cohesion piece often is looking at um, voices, especially in the context in which I work, vulnerable communities or, or those whose voices you don't often hear and how do you understand their use of infrastructure or of the challenges that this century faces in terms of uh, adaptation to climate, etc. So I think that that component um, it very much so resonates. And as far as governance, I think a lot of the work, and I don't know if this is true for, for you, Sebastian, but in the cities that I work, I feel like the, a lot of it is how do you engage different actors? So if you are working on a road, it doesn't necessarily uh, occur to the people in the Department of Transportation that they need to have a conversation with Health and Human Services Department and what that means in terms of looking at sanitation issues, et cetera, and how do you make better investments. So I think that the, you know, there's a governance issue in terms of just the normal division of government. And then I think that in Latin America, what we see a lot is, uh, for example, in Santiago de Chile, we have 52 municipalities being coordinated and having uh, different infrastructure being contemplated. So it's certainly governance even in that, in that metropolitan stance, I would say. Okay, maybe a last question for both of you. It's usually admitted that uh, the more diverse a system is, it's true for ecosystem, for example, the more resilient it is. But then if it's very diverse with different type of companies, different type of players, different type of institutions, it's obviously more difficult also to gather them and to align them on a, on a vision, on a strategy. How do you combine both dimensions? How do you combine both dimensions of... Uh, like diver fostering diversity ah. because it's good for resilience, but then having all these diverse players that you need to align on the same strategy? That's a good question. I mean, I think that my experience of that has been more so in, when I have thought about the question, what makes a resilient city or what does that really mean in practice to see the whole city as being resilient? I frankly come down to very specific uh, initiatives or ideas about what, what that city is implementing and what that means for resilience building. So I think that I tend to believe that the engaging certain actors or the, a diverse number of actors, it depends on the specificity of that problem. And so not all actors are going to be engaged and that it's possible then that it's disjointed in terms of the way initiatives are built or, or but I would overall understand um, there to be specific problems. And I think that when one thinks about those three elements perhaps around you know, human-centered development and infrastructure, you are tackling things that are, are very specific. So, that's how I would think okay. about it. Okay, Sebastian, what's your experience? Is it possible to foster diversity of actors and then at the same time fo to foster alignment between all of them with different views? I think alignment is not really resilient. And uh, express diversity is also allowing that uh, uh, non -every not everybody is going to be part of it. I agree, it depends on the issue, depends on the solution we're building, etc. But I just would like to highlight the fact that um, it's much easier now to manage this diversity thanks to the data and technological revolution, for instance, that provides new tools that didn't exist five or ten years ago uh, in order to get the, the, the data, the information of very various actors to uh, create information systems that allow them to communicate and to provide solutions and to work together. And so this data revolution, which is just a tool, and I'm not saying that smart city is a goal or whatever, it's a tool, a tool for something, but it's a great tool for resilience. And so that's just to end maybe, um, that's also what we can uh, retain from, from, what we can think about resilience. Within our cities, we've been developing smart city strategies, climate plans, uh, inclusion strategies, management strategies, but in silos. 
and each strategy doesn't communicate that much with the other ones. And Resilience proposes to articulate all these processes in a unique framework that allows to uh, increase efficiency uh, and coherence. And it's difficult to implement, of course, because we face bureaucracies in our public sector and so on. But it's really relevant, and I think it's the key to uh, embed resilience in the cities. Okay, thank you very much. So, now we move to the second uh, moment of this session, uh, which is questions from the audience to our speakers. And then our speakers will ask you guys questions, so don't go away. <laughs> um, anybody has a question? If not, I have a list, huh? but it's the, not the game. I was told the audience will ask questions. Ah, thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. First of all, thanks very much for a very informative panel. Um, I'm particularly interested on the people side of it and the social cohesion. So what sort of methodologies are you backing or researching? Uh, one of the elephants in the room where, um, which often come up, is getting all of the people, getting access to the minority groups, the people that are not willing to uh, contribute in, in, sort of com in participatory processes. Uh, they're key to social cohesion, so I'm just interested in methodologies and yeah, your experience. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, I think that's a good question. It was something that we've been working on a lot in, um, in the context of my cities is, um, that I work closely with is, there's a concept, um, Rebuild by Design was a competition that was uh, launched in New York after uh, Hurricane Sandy. And the idea was that it was a design competition asking a number of actors to form teams, meaning anthropologists, architects, uh, coming from different skill sets and designing and looking at infrastructure design uh, but I think the important part there is that the, the actual infrastructure design was taken back to the community, so the community was engaged from the beginning, then the actual design was taken back, and then a lot of feedback comes, comes from the community, and so actually the design is reiterated upon. And so I think that a lot of what we're trying to create in certain contexts in Puerto Rico or in Mexico City, et cetera, is the same concept of being iterative in terms of, I don't think you always, you don't always have the luxury of having a design competition where you have architects, et cetera, but what the uh, governments have been able to do is at least design teams where internal to their state or municipal government, they create uh, someone from the housing department, somebody from Parks and Rec, some, somebody from other uh, divisions, and then that the, the idea is still the same in terms of taking that design back to the community and have it be iterative in terms of that opinion, and I think that that's shown to be um, much more resilient in terms of design. Sebastian? Hmm. Um, I would talk about the neighbors, and um, this is going to be part of Paris' uh, strategy to reinforce social cohesion, uh, social links on a daily basis, uh, and it's not that frequent in Paris, maybe more in the countryside or in smaller cities, um, but the idea that these relationships uh, with neighbors is a key for social link. And once you have relationship with your neighbors, you, you have relationship in a wider place, including the people around you, uh, in the uh, other buildings, and then it's a block uh, community that is getting increasing and increasing. And um, many initiatives already exist in Paris. Uh, people want places to organize uh, barbecues or whatever, or to uh, a fest between neighbors or whatever. And we are missing place in Paris. Missing place because it's one of the most dense city of the world and we don't have that much place. So one of the action, methodology speaking, is we want to, to allow the people to use more public spaces and facilities uh, during hours where they're not used for uh, other matters. And so we want to create something simple. You want to organize something with your neighbors in a solidarity action or whatever. Uh, you would like to use the, the square which is just in front of your uh, house to do that. 
We aim to create an app or something really simple and not five or six application, one to the state, one to the city, and then you wait to, to three weeks to get a no, uh, an answer that is no. Uh, and so this is, for instance, a, a key. So it's complicated within the terrorism context because, of course, for the state, people convening together in the street are targets. Uh, for the national authorities, but we've been negotiating a lot with them, saying that anyways, to face a terrorist attack, it's better that people know each other and support each other. So if we can scale it in many different areas, allowing people to, to do things together, whatever, uh, but to meet, to know each other, when there is a shock, you will, if you know that two floors upper, you have an elderly uh, person uh, that has difficulties to move, you'll think about her. If you don't even know she exists, of course, she will stay uh, during the fire of the building, for instance. So th that's the kind of methodology, part of it, that we want to apply. Thank you very much. Another question here. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. So my question is just a follow-up question. So you said that there are, I guess you're talking about the fit, the the quartier, but maybe, but that is very specific to each quartier or each district in Paris. And what are some of the things that are being done in terms of inter-district co uh, social cohesion or more uh, inclusion between the different districts? Because they're very different in terms of socially, economically, uh, there's just a lot of difference between the different districts. Yeah, that's true, but Despite the fact that there are inequalities between districts, there are also inequalities within a, a unique district. And at first, we think that we have to, to, to work on this um, because there are homeless uh, everywhere in every district. There are migrants, uh, in not more in some districts, less in other ones. Uh, and so this idea to work at first at the micro um, level, scale, um, is really the idea that starting with initiatives, allowing people to build themselves the initiatives, that's the key. It's not the cities that say to the people, you should do that and convene and whatever. It's just the idea to pass from a city that is regulating to a city that is authorizing. Uh, authorizing people to do things. Because, you know, us as cities, we want to create laws, rules, and you have to respect them when you get a ticket and so on. And so, uh, starting, and we are copying Latin America, for instance, or other cities uh, th that are much more developed on this micro-level uh, thing, and then once you have a, a, a group of inhabitants that is structured and works, uh, usually, it's natural. They meet with other groups from other districts, and most of the time, they even sometimes they create federation to be stronger against the city, for instance. Um, and so, uh, we believe that it can. We don't especially have to manage it. It, it can comes from the on the bottom up approach comes from the people and from one district to another district. Actually, it exists already. Groups of inhabitants um, uh, work together already, and it's not the cities that organize it. Not in all the districts, I agree. There are some exceptions. <laughs> I won't tell which. Uh -huh. Olivia, do you have examples of such uh, social cohesion building, not only within districts, but inter-districts in from other cities you've seen, or initiatives that may be relevant to the question? I mean, I think the challenge in Latin America is, uh, I mean, social inequality is quite, quite uh, stark, and I think you see that the oftentimes the integration of communities um, takes on a level in which it's it's not it's it's oftentimes spatial and there's also quite large challenges in terms of them being in a far rural area or rather on the outskirts of town or within the city but simply not integrated in terms of uh, access to education or resources so I think that the way uh, the most relevant example to my mind especially in the context of Latin America I would say is Medellin and so in Medellin, we've seen a lot of innovation in terms of, and again, I think it goes back a little bit to this point of, you know, human-centered development or thinking about people and thinking about infrastructure. So I think uh, when we're thinking about this integration between neighborhoods, I mean, you have uh, shanty towns on the hill or like favelas 
and you have uh, you know, the rich living in the valley. And so the question becomes, how do they become integrated? But the question isn't just in terms of, okay, let's build escalators and provide uh, you know, those kind of resources for free, but what, what are they lacking in terms of access? So libraries, uh, public health institutions, and understanding that this is also a, an entryway for jobs and employment. And so how are you looking at, again, and I think this is what goes a little bit to this idea of what is resilience and what are stresses? And so how do you integrate all of that thinking around what really is limiting their access to certain resources and how are you integrating that into the larger mainstream. Okay, thank you very much. Last question maybe in the audience, yes. Hello, uh, I'm sorry it's gonna be a bit of a loaded question, but you, one who started talk about uh, migrants for example, and I live actually in the 18th district, so near La Chapelle, so one of the areas where we had lots of migrants, and I also saw a lot of neighbor initiatives to help them. And I know people engage in those initiatives, and the main thing I saw and I heard from a few, I continue to hear, not only in Paris, is that those people actually are the state and uh, also police, and so the city and the nation are fighting those associations. So those people actually, the main problem today is that the state not letting them help migrants. They fighting the, the actual uh, power and said, so there is an inconsistency between what you're saying about you want to encourage neighbor initiatives and what we're seeing in the real is that actually the forces of state actually fighting those associations. The state, but not the city. I mean, the... No, that's important, that's important. And you know, this movement, everywhere in the world, and we could see that after Trump's decision, is to get the power back to the cities. Um, because the state uh, are not that um, turned to innovation. And in the cities, it's much easier. In Paris, because, of the, because the state didn't want to take into account the migration problem, the mayor of Paris decided to build the welcoming center, the host center, it's not enough. I agree, it's not enough. There are many problems around, etc. So but at least it's something. It's something, and, and the mayor decided to do it without the agreement of the state. The state said, no, you shouldn't build this center. And the mayor said, I will, anyway, because these people are in my city, and it's more my problem than your president of the republic. And so that's also why this movement, 100 Resilient City, is really relevant, is that the idea is that the solution to face this main challenge is migration, because what we've been living now about migration is just an artifact of what we're going to, uh, to live in the coming decades. The UN, the numbers of the UN are clear, just because of climate change, we'll have more than 10 times more migrants on the roads uh, in the coming decades. So, for instance, in our resilience strategy, and with a, a partner of 100 Resilient City, which is uh, International Rescue Committee, uh, we conducted a study uh, aiming at including the migration issue in, an, in the urban project. Not in a human, humanitarian um, uh, background to help these people punctually. To think that as we're going to face migration flows for 40 years, 50 years, maybe more, how the way we build the city uh, is able to include this new issue. And so it's really innovative, and we don't know exactly yet what it's going to be concretely, but we're working on it. Olivia, are there examples of how other cities have included this issue of related to migrants in their resilience strategy? I mean, from my experience, some of this is quite new for uh, certain cities in Latin America. I mean, actually, you know, a lot of people immigrate, leave, leave Latin America. But in the case of Chile, Santiago de Chile, there, uh, there's a lot more uh, immigrants from Haiti that are arriving. And so I think, what my, from my experience, it's kind of on the tail end in that they're very interested in learning from other cities like Paris and uh, other cities in Europe to understand, in fact, what are good policies to integrate people because it's not really been the experience of, of so many cities in Latin America of, of uh, kind of this reverse migration. Okay, so I was told that we, we, we're going to have a bit more minutes so we can take maybe one or two additional questions in the audience if there are questions no 
You sure? You're not going to regret it? Okay, so I have one. Ah, there's one. Okay. Hello? Yeah, I was just wondering, because um, obviously resilience and complexity theory have some overlap, and I was just wondering if that sort of informs your work, uh, and, and if so, in what way? Can you repeat, please? Uh, complexity theory, just the, uh -huh. the yeah. Yeah, that's the, actually, sometimes we think we're going to get crazy thinking about resilience, because of that, if, once you think in the systemic approach, it never ends. Uh, the scales, territorial, uh, time scale, uh, territorial scale, actor scales, and so on. And once you, you want to mix all this, you, you just turn and say everything is in everything and the opposite. And, and so I agree, <laughs> that's a huge issue. We have many societies proposing tools, um, information systems that are supposed to represent resilience uh, through a tool, an electronic tool or whatever. To be honest, I don't really believe in it because I experienced some and it's always it's only partial. It's never complete. And so I think we have to be modest about this uh, complexity and say that we try to reduce the complexity, but we want to reach the global, uh, the global uh, approach that is totally systemic and that we can predict uh, all the consequences of one action and the other, about the other one and so on. So we try to reach this and to be more efficient on this, but I think we will never uh, get to the end. <laughs> Olivia, on complexity I... theory and resilience, what's, I... what's in your framework? How do you solve <laughs> complexity? I mean, I, I, I find that a fascinating question. I, I think it's, um, it's very theoretical, and perhaps as a pragmatic American, I'm uh, very interested in applying it and seeing what it means in terms of practice. So, um, you know, I think that when I think about resilience and I think about it practice in a city, I think, um, I think, you know, the, the important part is look at the three or four elements that are important in terms of designing that infrastructure, and then how does that implement in terms of what are the adaptive qualities and, you know, so looking at global forecasts or, or scenario, future scenarios, et cetera, in terms of trying to understand some of the complexity, but ultimately that you are going to have to design around people and, and make solutions that make sense in that, in that city. So I don't know that that answers it exactly, but I think that's how we, uh, we think about it. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Now that you know you have a bit more time. A few minutes to think. <laughs> no? Okay, but you... Ah! So I'll, I'll use it in advertising ploy. Um, at 4 p.m. tomorrow, we're doing a workshop answering this specific question. Um, just outside in the tent, and it's going to be understanding how to almost harness complexity. So instead of when we are encounter complexity, we're like trying to poke a tiger with a stick and it bites us, or rather, how do you tame the lion? How can you leverage complexity? But actually, the answer you gave is very similar. What are the very few simple uh, interventions and conditions we can lay in place that can actually generate a maximal response from complex systems? And we can use some biological examples as well. Um, now, how do I phrase this as a question? Does that sound interesting? <laughs> <laughs> Good, I'm, gl I'm glad that sounded consistent and I'm glad we, uh, we established that. <laughs> okay, so now we, uh, we have the, exactly the opposite, so you can ask him questions because now we're supposed, you're sup you guys are supposed to ask questions to the audience. Do you have one, Sebastian, Olivia? Um, are there any Parisians in the attendance? Ah, oh, there are. So I'm just going to make a survey. Um, we want, in order to, I, I said counting on people to build the resilience of the city. Um, and for instance, we want to build something that is, exists in many other cities, uh, but not that much in France, many other countries, uh, but not that much in France, which is a civil contingency or a community response group or people who agree to be registered in a kind of reserve or platform or something, uh, and agree to be trained 
uh, to respond to shocks, for instance, first aid uh, gestures and so on, and uh, who agree to be um, correspondent, uh, to uh, strengthen uh, neighborhood relationships, uh, to organize micro-social uh, solidarity actions or whatever, based on voluntary, uh, very... Um, uh, we don't want to create a structure that you have to subscribe to or whatever. Something very simple, very easy, uh, but we need to know if the people are going to be interested in it. So if we create such uh, a reserve of inhabitants for resilience, uh, who would be part of it here? Okay, so it, it, it's much less than the number of Parisians in the room. But, uh, <laughs> il veut répondre, il veut répondre. Okay. <laughs> ah, no. Police force. I know. No, no, it really sounds like you want to mobilize police force. You want to, you want to use citizens as unpaid labor. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Wow, I'm sorry, um, it sounds like it. Yeah, this is, actually, that's exactly the reaction we have in, in a symmetric way from the state and the emergency services. They say, but it's not the inhabitants' business, it's ours because uh, us, institution, we know how to do and what is going to do. But if you go, for instance, to Wellington, New Zealand, the whole city is covered by groups of inhabitants, volunteers that are trained, and that in case of major shock, we don't have enough firemen, we don't have enough police, we don't have... And, and so this idea is that if the emergency services can't come to help your neighbor because he's dying or whatever, can't you have just an organized staff with people who are trained, a, a bit used to, and that can just help the neighbor or the people? It exists in many countries, actually, in the UK, in the US, uh, in southern countries, in Latin America, in Rio de Janeiro, I know they have something like that. And the other thing is that we don't, just to complete my, my idea, as we said, resilience is not only shocks, but also main stresses. The idea is also to uh, work with the people who are interested in it about stresses and not only about shocks. For instance, how to support migrants. Uh, you in your neighborhood, do you know that there are migrants around? And uh, if you, you have, I don't know, 100 or 200 people who subscribe and you just uh, send an info uh, to these people saying there are a new group of migrants arrived in your neighborhood. Just in case you want to support, you can know that they are here. And that's what is working in other cities, it's working in other countries, and we believe that it can work in Paris, especially because um, after the, um, the terrorist attack, thousands of people wanted to be trained, and we are receiving many requests from citizens saying, how can I be useful, how can, can I be part of it? But the idea is not that it's managed by the city, it has to be managed by the people themselves. The thing is the city provides the framework, mm. uh, the tool or something, but then it's managed by the people. Okay, we had someone um, behind you. Yeah, yeah I, I know this example and I'm using Take it a lot. I know people who've been involved, they get training in first aid and different things. You know, we suffer a lot of earthquakes and whatnot there. It's a really, really good thing. It's not exploitation of labor at all. It's a really good thing. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Another lady here and then the yeah. one in the uh, back. So I live in Paris also and I wanted to react to what you said because there's already like digital platform working on the neighborhood and such. And uh, I, I was wondering what um, your tool will uh, provide um, another point of view or something, because I feel like there's so many initiatives right now, and uh, it's like if you create something else, it's like getting lost again into like several initiatives, so I'm kind of worried about this. Sure, I totally agree, and that was our first assessment. We convened all these startup application and informal networks. We identified more than 30 just within Paris. Um, part of them are uh, um, private businesses. Um, they're not NGOs, 
some of them like Smile, for instance, that you might know, that was called Mon Petit Voisinage before. <laughs> Uh, they, they are private businesses. Other ones like uh, Voisin Solidaire uh, are um, NGOs. And they are informal, many informal networks like that at a, a really s local level. So we convened all these people in workshops, we worked with them, and they helped us to design this solution, to be honest. For sure, for some of them, they thought that they are interested in the solution because they, they could be the heart of it. <laughs> Um, but in, as I just said, the idea is it has to be crowdsourced and not managed by any organization or whatever. That's the idea. And what we could add on this is, yeah, a few better coordination among them. Because the idea is not to exclude them from the system, but to include them. Yeah, but I knew we need to talk because I think the... the, the, the Good question is more like how do you empower the people because I mean uh, if people like me are interested to do that kind of things it's not the case of like every citizen and the, the, the right question is more like how do you empower every citizen to do that kind of things because most of them they don't feel like they give up on their sovereignty you know um, they just give it to the government like okay the government will manage everything and it's not the case so I think this is the, the right question you know. Thing is, in France, I pay taxes, so everything is the state business or the city business. And because I pay taxes, I don't have to do anything. I can throw away my waste on the street. I pay taxes for people to get to take care of it. That's the French culture, but that's not at all in other countries. And um, and so we really want to, yeah, we we want to be innovative. Maybe it won't work, but we want to try. And the idea of resilience is also to experiment things, to try new solutions, to evaluate them, and if it's not working, we stop. Uh, but we think that really, um, uh, based on the experience of the cities of the 100 resilient network, for instance, San Francisco, I love also their SF72, they train people to stay 72 hours uh, within their building without being able to uh, go out uh, uh, with, uh, without being able to have water or whatever. And you know, their approach, it's totally different than in France. In France, we, in our risk culture is to say, be careful, there is a huge risk, it's going to be terrible, and you're going to suffer a lot, but be prepared. Um, that's the way the public institutions communicate about risk. In San Francisco, they have this program uh, saying, you're going to face the big one, uh, earthquake, fire, whatever. But good news, that's the title of the program you're more prepared than you think. The title of its, its official institutional communication, you are more prepared than you think. And after you have a lot of training program and so on, and you know, this, in this list of what you need in case of shock, you need the water, batteries, uh, lamp, and so on. And so they list all this, and at the end they say, as you're going to stay stuck in your building, uh, don't forget a bottle of wine and games to have fun with your neighbors. And there is, you see, the bottle of wine at the same level than the pharmacy, and the, uh, and this is official public communication. We are far from this in France, but uh, we we are aiming to through this resilience approach, testing um, because maybe we need to change of culture, we need to change of habits uh, in order to be more resilient. Okay, thank you very much. So, I was told that we had till 40. And then we need to be resilient because I was just told that, in fact, we only we need to stop. So, so we, I'm just going to take two quick comments from you guys who had mics in the back. But please be short, otherwise I'll be killed. Thank you. Yeah, sure, I'll be super short. I think just to uh, go back to the Australia and New Zealand example and probably some of the other country, the reason it might be successful is by um, the strong sense of community and community has value. And uh, having lived in Paris for a bit, I don't think we've got this strong sense of community. And if the city could have something and use its communication to build this sense of community and educate people around community, I think it's much more useful than, than those platforms that I've built in Australia and in other countries. Thank you very much. Second comment. Um, yes, sorry, so just to follow up on the previous statement about um, you asked if we were interested in having uh, being trained to help in terms of 
are in an event that there's an emergency, but my question, or rather a thought since we don't have much time is, as opposed to preparing citizens um, to respond to crises, what is going to be done in terms of future prevention? Because for example, when you have, like for example, with the uh, crisis that, or the terrorist attack that took place in November, uh, lots of people were on Facebook, for example, saying like, our doors are open if you're in whichever uh, neighborhood. So I think that that's already kind of, we've kind of got that covered, but what is going to be done in order to prevent uh, future, future terrorist attacks, which often come from a lack, in my personal opinion, of social cohesion because Paris is so multicultural, multiracial, Things okay, like so it's a kind of question, so we'll ask them a kind of answer, but you can yeah, follow up after the session. Just a quick word of conclusion from each of you. One minute, Olivia and then Sebastian. Yeah, and I think on, on a general level, and this, doesn't exact, this certainly isn't meant to answer that question, uh, but I think that the point is that there's a lot of things you can't prepare for and that... Uh, or you can't, you can't uh, mitigate to the point where you don't need to be prepared. So I think that um, you know, there continues to be these larger questions, and I think that what we're interested in is that is, in fact, so how do you think about um, preparing for and adapting and thriving in those contexts? And I think that even just this discussion was quite interesting in terms of the volunteering, because we're very interested in frameworks and how helping cities think about the different components of resilience and what's important. And I think that there are very much so value judgments in terms of how, what will work and what will not work. So Americans, we are very interested in volunteering. It's just part of uh, our culture and something that we do. And so it, it's a no-brainer for us that you would create these kind of groups. And it, for us, it's interesting to, to understand or see if other cities adapt that approach. And so the idea that, oh, it's free labor or uh, that kind of reaction is very different. And I think that that's the point that you have to... Um, uh, create a, a strategy and something that's relevant to that context and to that city and that not everything is necessarily going to translate but there is a lot of learnings you can learn from other cities in, in terms of design. Thank you very much, Olivia. Um, resilience might be at the moment a kind of buzzword. Uh, talking more and more about resilience in many... But I advocate or uh, to say that uh, resilience is not a new fashion after the smart city, the inclusive city, the cities for with zero unemployment, the cities with zero waste, and so on. It's much more than that. Um, maybe it's a fashion that is going to provide more jobs or more opportunities to consulting firms, a bit, uh, like other ones, but it's more deeper than that. And the best example is the motto of Paris. You know the motto, these old sentences we have on the front of the official building and that we totally forget? The motto of Paris is fluctuat nec mergitur. It means um, the boat is soaked by the storm and the waves but never sinks. Uh, it's a perfect, it's a really good definition of resilience. It has been official since 1853. It's Baron Haussmann uh, who uh, created officially uh, this motto. But it had been created more than a thousand years ago by the Parisi, the people who created Lutes, uh, so it's the previous name, the really uh, old name of Paris, at the time where Paris was surrounded by Vikings and uh, facing pandemias and so on. And at this time, the city decided to, uh, to have this motto uh, as a kind of slogan saying, we'll be resilient anyway. So it's... Resilience is relevant when future is uncertain. And I think now we're facing this period. Thank you very much to both of you, to all of you. We are almost on time. Thanks. <laughs>